Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show all about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined as ever by football journalist and United season ticket holder Rob Blanchett. You can subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, etc, etc. And now you can watch us twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays on YouTube as well. So head over to the channel, hit the like button, subscribe, join the community and leave a comment for us. The link should be in the description of this episode. If you're listening on audio, uh, Rob, we, we now have left the season behind. Uh, no more football to worry about. No more awful performances to predict or have to soak in. <laughs> uh, and now it's all about time to rebuild, I guess. Uh, so this week, Eric Ten Hag's been unveiled and the transfer speculation's ramping up, isn't it? Yep, it's all about who's next. Thankfully, that season is done and dusted and we don't have to watch any more of the actual football. But like everything in our profession, it's all ramped up already. We're straight into transfer mode. Manchester United are chopping around, doing their business. Tons of rumours that we have to address and chase up and find out what's really true and what isn't. And hopefully we can share some of that with you today. Yes, indeed. We'll talk all about Christopher and Kunku today. We'll talk about... Frankie de Jong today. We'll talk about some things Sadio Mane's had to say on uh, turning down Man United for Liverpool a few years ago. I, obviously, that's public knowledge, but he's uh, he's spoken to, I think, Jamie Carragher about it ahead of the Champions League final, which Liverpool are in and Manchester United are not in, uh, as we all know, uh, later this week or Saturday evening in Paris. Uh, we'll also talk about the financial results which have been released as well. Uh, United's debt is up obviously, but commercial income has risen. And some comments from Richard Arnold have uh, circulated around, maybe irritating fans slightly. Maybe we'll just uh, talk through that and have to, you know, set you straight a little bit. If you're, if you're a little bit worried about what those comments mean, you know, it's not all bad, but there, there's a lot of growth here and it doesn't always mean, you know, we need to sign 15 players or whatever. There's a lot of talent in the squad, which has just been managed awfully over the last few months uh, and as we've seen on the pitch it's not worked out but you know how much lower can United go I don't really think it can get much worse than that and it might be time to start looking up again uh, today you can listen to us for about 45 minutes we'll see how long we go but a reminder you can follow us on Twitter too at underscore Scott Saunders at underscore Rob underscore B and at promise and MU for the show as well give us a follow uh, so Christopher and Kunku Rob uh, you wanted to talk about him today because you're a big fan. Uh, what is the statistics? 35 goals and 15 assists. Plays for RB Leipzig. Uh, 70 to 80 million euros to get him out. And while it's been suggested that Leipzig do not want to sell, they've qualified for the Champions League as well. The speculation with United persists, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. This was one of uh, Ralph's wish list players going back to when he first came to the football club. Now, obviously, there was no business going to be done at that time. Manchester United were not going to sanction anything for him. But he was one of those players that when United were talking about strikers or forwards, he was on that list. Now, it seems that Ten Hag as well is a big fan of the player. And United have got this pool now of forwards that they're looking at. And Konku definitely is one of those players. Uh, yes, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, I think sometimes you can look at German uh, forwards. Obviously, he's not German, but plays in the Bundesliga. And players that have had success there doesn't always translate straight away to the Premier League, does it? I'm thinking kind of Timo Werner type player. Jaden uh, Sancho. <laughs> Jaden Sancho. But of course, again, we, we sit here and we have faith in Jaden, don't we? We do believe that in time he will be a, a worthy signing for Manchester United. But I think the same issue with, say, with Werner and say we look at Nkunku is that Nkunku is a totally different player, you know, and he's better. You know, he scores goals, he gets assists. Um, he's got just so much more to his game than, say, Timo Werner. Um but he's totally the type of forward I think Manchester United should be shopping for. And I think that's what's really important. Lots of obviously links with Darwin Nunes. That seems to have gone a little bit cold, but I'm sure that will pop back up in the very near future. But I think Nkunku is, is, in terms of being Premier League ready and his style of game, I think he could be an incredible, dangerous weapon for Manchester United. Yeah, Rob, talk me through what uh, he's like as a player nowadays. He's 24. Uh, I think he came through PSG's academy and didn't Did. really make the grade uh, and has found himself at Leipzig hmm. since 2019, actually. He has uh, 31 goals in 94 appearances. But he's he, obviously, for a prolific centre-forward, 
you know, that's not a great record nowadays, but he isn't that exact type of player, is he? So he, he can play right, he can play left, he can play through the middle. Uh, what, what kind of player would United be getting if they were to pull this off? Well, when I was speaking about him on Twitter just yesterday and we were talking through the rumours and what was going on with the player, I, I made a comparison that he's very much a hybrid between Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah. Now, that's, that's a big comparison in terms of player type. But that's the kind of player he is in terms of systematic. What can he do for you? He can play left, he can play right, and through, play through the centre. And his work in the channels is almost perfect. Brilliant timing, quick off the mark, makes really good decisions, can link up play, can score goals, can do it all. And I think they're like you, you highlighted there his time at PSG and uh, moving to Leipzig. He's the perfect Red Bull player. So this is why Ralph has spoken about him and has recommended him to Manchester United over a period of time. It's because they took a player who wasn't really fancied, they put him through his marks, and they've come out the other side with a talent who's pushing 70, 80 million in terms of his value. And one of the things I said yesterday as well is that Man United needs to go and get this player before Liverpool do. Because you can see this, I can smell it already. If if, Ma- if Salah or Mane leave uh, Liverpool, and there's a chance one of them might in the next few weeks, we just don't know yet, certainly Mane being that player at the moment, but Salah's going to be out of contract in a year. This is the player they will go and get, I'm sure of it, because he just fits that 4 3 free system so well. He can do all of those things. A modern forward like, like Luis Diaz, do you know what I mean? Can play on the left, but can come inside, can do all that work for you. Um and United need to progress like this, Scott. They need to go and find signings that are not necessarily at the very, very top echelon. It's not, it's not Haaland, is it? But it's someone who's proved over a period of time that he can do it and that he can execute. Yeah, he was uh, named in May, well, that's literally this month, uh, the 2021-22 Bundesliga Player of the Season after his, uh, his goal-scoring form in the Bundesliga and... Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you do see a lot of players linked with United, but it, it does seem to be the same names. It's like a, a core of names at the moment, isn't it, Rob? Like, I know that United are looking for four positions, midfielders, you know, a flexible forward, a versatile forward, is, and, and Kunku certainly fits this mould. Uh, centre-halves, maybe two midfielders, and possibly a right-back as well. Uh, Nordi Mukieli, who's a teammate of uh, Nkunku's at Leipzig, has also been linked uh, in French press today, but we at 90 Min reported some interest from Ralph Ranick and, and United even as far back as December. And he's gone quite cheap, 10 million euros or something like that, a contract in 2023. So, you know, the, the same names seem to be cropping up, Rob. Do you think it's a case of just United have identified like a pool of targets and, you know, it'll be which one is most gettable to bring in? Absolutely, this is what they're doing now. So this is the, the the kind of the search and destroy method of Manchester United. Go through the market, find out who fits their narrative and who their profile of player, what are they looking for, talk to those agents, see who's interested and see who bites. So I, I think the thing is that will be different this year, and this is just a prediction, is that I don't think Manchester United will be as outward in the press and the way that they leak their information as maybe they were in previous incarnations. So closing down the Ed Woodward era of transfer business, where there was just lots of yapping, and lots of talk and lots of leaks. It's from all the, for the social media engagement, Rob, isn't it? This is the thing with Manchester United, and we always try in our jobs to take it with a pinch of salt because we do sometimes know that Man United and their contacts are playing games, and we don't really want to play games. We want to report stuff that's as close to factual as possible. You know, like some of it will be rumours and gossip, but we're trying to link it together with people who actually know what they're talking about. So I think when you look at Nkunku and players around that ilk, so we've talked about Darwin Nunes, We'll talk a little bit more about Frankie de Jong. There's plenty of players at the moment that are on Manchester United's remit of, of, of talent that they're looking at. And as I said last week as well on our show, I really do think that things will move pretty quick in the next few weeks because Manchester United will want to make a statement. They'll want to bring players in early before pre-season kicks in because Ten Hag is that kind of guy. It's already been said by his new assistant, Steve McLaren, that this guy just that does not leave any stone unturned He's so thorough in his preparation. He wants to get it right early so he can get on with his actual job. Of course, United have done this thing in the last uh, 
last few windows, which irritates so many fans. Of you remember the Harry Maguire story about, yeah, you know, we we won't we won't pay 80, 85 million for him. No, Leicester, we're we're not going to do it. Let's try and drag it out as far as we can. We get to you know I can't remember when it exactly was that it happened, but July at some point. Absolutely got nothing off the fee. Ended up paying eighty million nope. euro, eighty million pounds, and we all know where we are with Harry Maguire nowadays. But something has to change, doesn't it? And it's it's a. Are you slightly encouraged that the people who were doing that, pulling those, trying to pull those deals off, Matt Judge? You know, I we really don't know how heavily involved Ed Woodward was during those times and how much he had to play during that. But he oversaw it all. You know. Uh, it, do you have confidence that this new team can start to actually act quickly and to, you know, walk away from a transfer if it's not right for them price-wise? Totally. And I think that this is kind of where Manchester United want to change that direction. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned Matt Judge because obviously he was the chief negotiator for Manchester United for all those transfers. And you look at the Harry Maguire one, and let's compare that, say, to the Jaden Sancho one. So almost identical in terms of method of strategy. And that is... We're going to dig in and we're not going to buy this player until we decide we're happy with the price. Now, with Maguire, you got that price that in the end that you didn't want to pay 80 million, but you paid it. Jaden Sancho, if you wanted to get him before, he was going to cost you 107, 108, 109 million, and you got him for a much, much reduced fee on that. So it works sometimes. The issue with it, Scott, is that it hurts your team if you decide not to buy players because you're not paying certain transfer fees. Um, but at the same time, you do have to walk away from deals that do not suit you. So I think that's what we'll see more. There'll be more of a swift action from Manchester United with players where they'll either go, yep, that's the player we want and we'll go and get him. Or they'll back off straight away and kind of do what Liverpool do. You know, Liverpool do that. Liverpool like, we like this player doesn't fit what we're doing at the moment. The agent doesn't help us. The club is not helping us. We're out of here. But when someone like Luis Diaz came in the market, mentioning him again, and Tottenham were triggering that interest because they wanted the player, Liverpool moved really swiftly to go and get him. So I think that's going to be the story of this summer and moving forward is that the new era, era under Richard Arnold will be that he'll empower those people in the football department, allow them to make quick, swift decisions. Because let's be honest, we need new players. You know, this is not, you're not going to get away with just signing one or two here. As Ralph Ranick said, it's five or six and maybe 10 or plus leaving. And that's all going to start unraveling now in the next week or two. Yeah, I think, Rob, you mentioned there about, uh, we were talking about walking away from deals, obviously. And I think mm -hmm. just to transition into more Frankie de Jong chat, uh, obviously we spoke about him in previous weeks. The interest is there from United. I don't think that's, that's not in doubt. Eric Ten Hag wants him. Uh, and not all is right at Barcelona at the moment. He hasn't exactly torn up trees there. He's not an automatic pick. He's got Gavi and Pedri and Sergio Busquets. Frank Kessie's joining Barcelona as well on a free transfer this summer. So he's not... He is one of Barcelona's uh, most valuable assets that they, that they could, uh, you know, help relent their financial situation with. But they haven't made decisions yet. Xavi's spoken about him this week, but has essentially charred the same line that he's been saying for a number of weeks, that Barcelona would like to keep him, but maybe they will have to sell dependent on the economic situation. Uh, and there's even uh, the United side of things, they're not putting this one down, but it's not no secret really that it's going to be a difficult move to complete for United. So uh, just some updates here. He would need convincing to join United because they're not in the Champions League, obviously. Um, but a, rule, a move hasn't been completely ruled out. Manchester City have distanced themselves from the player as well, and they look like they're looking at Calvin Phillips for a potential Fernandinho replacement. Uh, but it could be a fee of around £75 million, which Barca are looking for, but United are hopeful that they can get that cheaper if they can convince De Jong to move to United. Uh, how long can they leave this? How, how long can they play this game? And how much should they be paying for him? It really depends on what Ten Hag decides is the priority. So let's say, take, for instance, the goalkeeper, David De Gea. Lots of talk this week about De Gea's failings, but De Gea himself said he wants to stay at the football club, and David De Gea is going to stay at Manchester United. Why? Because goalkeeper is not the priority. There's plenty of other positions. Now, midfield is one of those positions. Interesting you mentioned Calvin Phillips there, obviously a former target at Manchester United going back over the last few months. 
completely now batted away by the Ten Hag administration. They don't want Calvin Phillips. They're not interested in him. That That's not going to continue there. So Calvin Phillips going to Barcelona might be a strange one. He's still going to be a premium Man- price. I meant Man City. Sorry, Manchester City. Uh, um, that would be, I think, not not strange in terms of the player fit, but, you know, is he exactly the same as Fernandinho? I'm not so sure. Uh, certainly in the leadership stakes as well. When you look at De Jong and what De Jong can offer Manchester United and offer Ten Hag, it's a systematic positive. So he would come in and he knows what the manager wants. That's the premium you're paying for. Someone that can come in, that's been at a top-line club already at Barcelona, and knows what pressure is. Now, you're saying that he needs convincing. I think it's more of a case that he needs to feel that Ten Hag has got the power at Manchester United to do the work. Because that's a big question now. I think a player who who knows Ten Hag will want to come in and say, OK, I'm part of your project, but I need to be convinced that Manchester United are not going to make a mess of this. Because what do they do, Scott? They make a mess of stuff, don't they? So that's, I think, where it comes down to. I don't think you would ever get close to Frankie de Jong 12 months ago with Ed Woodward. I just don't think you would. There'd be no conversation there. But what we do know is that the player and the manager have spoken and the deal isn't dead. Most interesting point, as you said there, Xavi, constantly saying basically everyone's for sale and that's and that's something that most coaches don't do isn't it most coaches play the line and go you know I love my play I leave that to the club but Javi is openly saying we need to balance the books so yeah I'm probably going to have to sell someone I don't want to Frank De Jong fits that profile Manchester United need to be aggressive they need to go and get him and they need to do it relatively quick you know I don't think you can drag this out all summer as you get to the last day of the transfer window what do Man United do Scott start banging on all sorts of doors, trying to arrange loans, trying to get players in, having to play double fees and all of that. So, Do you remember that that transfer window not too long ago when Cavani arrived? I don't know whether it was the same day that Cavani arrived that they also signed Ahmad Diallo and Palistri as well. It was just, Might have even been another player. I can't remember exactly. but It, 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 was, just, it was just like a, a mad like scattergun approach because they needed to get players in and over the line. But they didn't sign anyone that helped them. Like uh, One of the things yeah. that have come out of the Ralph Rangnick era now, and we're hearing more and more now as Ralph departs the club, is that he was massively questioned why Manchester United signed the players they've signed in the last two years, but didn't sign it to a positional strategy. So they went, Diallo, yeah, Palestri, yeah. They went back, you know, Ronaldo, let's go and get him. Oh, we need to send back, oh, Varane's on the market. Oh, but you'd spent weeks and months trying to get Pau Torres in, but then you dropped him for, like a bomb and bought Varane. The big thing for uh, Ralph was, why did you do that? Why do you do your business like that? So I think that's where the reset will come, because I do not believe for one second that Ten Hag is going to be anything like that. Yeah, going back to De Jong for a second, I completely agree with your point, to be honest. I mean, ideally, I don't think from my perspective, although it isn't my money, as we like, we should always make this point, it's not our money. We, we can't really, let's not complain about how much someone costs, even though it does kind of add pressure to the player, I guess, in a sense. But I think someone like Frankie De Jong, when Ten Hag is coming in and trying to implement his playing style, he's going to need players who know what he wants. Uh, to hit the ground running, essentially. And I think it's going to be quite a complex one to pick up, maybe, because these players haven't really been trained tactically forward playing football since Ralph gave up. And through Ollie's era as well, that they never played that way. So it's going to be completely different for them, I think. And I think the more players that you have who are able to help other players understand what is needed as soon as possible and help lead the, the stylistic change... I think De Jong fits that bill and I would really push for that to happen. Yeah, and I do think that Manchester United in, you know, year one of a manager, when they've had new managers, maybe not always to this effect, but overall, they are very keen to make that initial splash and that initial commitment to finances. So I I put forward Paul Pogba. I think that's a really important one. There's that Mourinho wanted Paul Pogba, United wanted Paul Pogba to come back and they spent weeks and months getting that deal over the line, really pushing hard to go and get Paul Pogba. And that was the marquee signing. But what did they do? They also got Mkhitaryan. They also got Baye. They also got Ibrahimovic. So they they made that big splash straight away in the market to support the manager. It's going to be the same this time around. I'm I'm 100% convinced that United will go and spend money because they've got to go out and reconfigure the squad. It might not be perfect, Scott. Like Again, football fans might look at this and 
feel that we know what the Glazers do and how they operate and how this football club runs its own business. But ultimately, you need to go and find the pieces that help this new manager. De Jong would do that. You know, he understands Ten Hag. And I think that's what Ten Hag has already put out there through his intermediates, that he needs to create a team in his image. Won't happen overnight, but it's going to happen as quick as possible. And you need to go into pre-season with all of that in place. You can't go into pre-season and still be doing what Man United generally do, which is getting towards the final day and then going, oh, Amid Diallo, we've signed Amid Diallo. Well, what does that mean? Does it help you? You've not won anything because you signed Amid Diallo. You didn't win anything because you signed Palestri. You know, they're good development projects, but I think United will need instant impact players as well, as well as looking at the squad at large and bringing in fresh talent. Yeah, uh, I think that's a nice little tie-in actually to... Uh, you said you said the line there, Rob, about needing players to, you know, help with the system and that kind of thing. And Richard Arnold's been speaking this week uh, about the financial results. Uh, we'll, we'll run through those first, but I think there's a comment that we probably need to pluck out of uh, recent things he said to talk about the quality of the playing squad that they've got and this kind of thing. But hey, Richard Arnold said, uh, while the club announced uh, that the depths have risen up to 500 million commercial income has risen, but obviously in the back end of COVID and that kind of stuff, everything's a little bit skewed anyway, uh, because no match day income or whatever for about 18 months or however mm -hmm. long it was. Uh, Richard Arnold said, it's clearly dis been a disappointing season for the men's first team. Work is well underway to address this, led by our football director, John Murta, and our new manager, Eric Ten Hag. Resilience and high standards are core values for Man United, and we're determined to achieve better results next season and beyond. Faith in youth, is another key tenet of the club and the continued success of our academy gives us confidence in the future. He also said uh, a line here, off the pitch, our revenues have continued to recover from the pandemic, reflecting the enduring strength of our commercial operation, which in turn support our ability to continue to invest in the club. But one point, I don't know whether you want to talk about the football director title that John Murta has, but keep that one in mind. But they've also intimated, uh, and it's kind of annoyed some fans that the club feel, and Eric Ten Hag feels, that there's enough quality in the United playing squad to uplift quite quickly without... Uh, obviously, I think they acknowledge that they need different signings and like to strengthen the squad in certain areas. But I think a lot of fans look at these players and then think, wow, they're all absolutely useless. They can't do a job for United anymore. And while we've been critical of the players themselves this season, and it has been mostly on them, you got to look at the conditions that they've had at the club and how difficult it must kind of be for them as well. Uh, because all of these players were brought to Man United for a reason. You know, the, these are players who have proven themselves at other clubs and have made a club like Man United take notice of them. So there's definitely more to get out of these players, Rob. Isn't it? It's not a case of let's shift every, every single player out of this squad straight away. It might happen in a transitional phase, but... There's definitely a lot of tools that Ten Hag can work with here. Absolutely. And I, and I, I, I compare it to the, the Klopp build at Liverpool. You know, you, you think about Jordan Henderson, about kind of where his career was the day Klopp walked in the door. And, you know, it's all been revisionised here now, isn't it? Liverpool fans love him. He's captain, worship, all of that. They all wanted him gone at that point, just in terms of a lot of those players that were useless because you're not doing what people think you could have done. You know, you've fallen down that pecking order and you're not you're not putting in the performances. But a new manager can trigger lots of those changes. So we're not saying suddenly Scott McTominay is going to become a world-class central midfielder. That's not the comparison I'm making. But Ten Hag needs to work with these players. And that's the first point. Now, of course, you're going to lose a ton of the squad simply because of the contract situations. And that's a good situation to be in because you can... You can weed out the ones that don't want to be there anymore. You don't need to pay any more lip service to them. We need to keep you for our squad in case we get injuries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can say goodbye to the Jesse Lingards of this world. You might be able to move on an anti martial You might be able to get rid of players that haven't helped you. Or it might be the case that Ten Hag now actually picks one or two of those players out that we all go, no, we, we don't want them anymore, and turns them into something decent. So you need to get the balance right. That's definitely the way it goes. And I think, again, with Ten Hag being what I would call a tracksuit manager, someone that works with the players directly on the pitch, ball at feet with the tactics, that's a good thing because he is going to be that manager that can either make it work 
or say, no, these these style of players do not work for what I want to do. Let's move them on. That's kind of what Klopp did in year one. He didn't he didn't completely just sell everyone. He went through the squad. He gave everyone opportunities, and there was one or two that flourished from that from that system and that opportunity at that time. So I think that's how Ten Hag will do it. And I still think that there are there are going to be a gem or two in this Man United squad that come forward, like even players I might not like. Do you know what I mean? It's just the way it goes. I just think that Ten Hag is that type of character that will be able to get the best out of players that we've not seen that from. Yeah, you have to. I, I know that I've been critical of the players as well for a long time this season. Uh, but they're so playing, obviously playing beneath their level and their prime confidence levels that you're not going to see the best of these players. And then you also throw in the fact that, you know, I think Gary Neville said it earlier this week, but I know I've said this a ton of times before. How many players have joined United in the last 10 years and actually looked and got better? <laughs> There's not many. They haven't really had those type of coaches to go and look to improve players who will actually work with them and, add strings to their bow and that kind of thing. Ten Hag is that type of manager. Yeah, and it's about having a, a coaching setup and a recruitment setup that promotes long-term development. Because I think with Manchester United, there were definitely times under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer where we saw players make jumps. So a good example, I think, is Luke Shaw. So Luke Shaw kind of had his injuries, had his problems, was kind of on the cusp of maybe leaving, given a new contract to stay. And you found that last season, which feels so far away ago now, like 12 months ago when Man United came second, Luke Shaw was probably the best fullback in the, in Europe or the world. So I think ultimately United have had that short-term development under coaches. They've never had a coach that can string that out over two, three, four years. And that is also where I think the Klopp and Henderson comparison really works, is that he took someone who was maybe unfashionable and made him an integral part of his squad. Not playing every week, but just being there and present and current and mattering and actually being relevant. And I think the problem with Man United is so much of the squad are irrelevant. You know, you look you look at someone like Marcus Rashford's form. You know, Marcus Rashford has gone from being one of the high, most highly rated young players in Europe to kind of being just in some strange wilderness, isn't he? It's like, it, it feels like he... He's not even a Man United player anymore. It feels cut adrift, but that's because of how the football club has been running as well as his own personal form. Yeah, I mean, you talk about Liverpool there, Rob, and I look at somebody like Andy Robertson, for example, as well, who was plucked out of Scottish football by, you know, he played for Hull for a while, but he was in the same team as Harry Maguire, for example. I did a piece on him. I did a you piece know? on him when he was at Hull, right? And when, when Liverpool signed him for 8 million quid, people were saying, why are they signing this guy for 8 million quid? And I remember writing in a piece saying, you know, this is a kind of uncut diamond that if a, if a right manager gets him, he's going to be a top Premier League fullback. And people were like, but, 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 but that's where Man United should go shopping. Go find those players. They're there. The scouting reports support all of these things. Just that Man United have ignored it for so many years, Scott, and they've gone and got players. I remember that like the Di Maria year and that to, to kind of... Um, to, to balance those out, the books and players coming in, it ended up with a Schweinsteiger and a Falcao. Now, I like Falcao and I like Schweinsteiger and I was happy when they came to the club, but they're not the right signings, are they? You need something that's going to have a long-term development a curve to it. So go and find your Andy, go and find your Andy Robinsons because th this is where you need to be in terms of talent and to get a squad that is competing for the title in two or three years' time, not just thinking about the next 12 months. Yeah, speaking of uncut diamonds um, and players who've gone on to improve, to go to another level, uh, Sadio Mane at Liverpool, we all know how good he mm. is. Uh, we all know, or most of us I'm sure know about how United made a play for him uh, just before he joined Liverpool. I think it was under Louis van Gaal. Yeah. Louis van Gaal wanted Sadio Mane and he's done an interview ahead of the Champions League final and has said... I have to say, I was really close to going to Man United. I had the contract there, all agreed. It was all ready. But instead, I thought, no, I want to go to Liverpool because Klopp called him and I was convinced to go with his project. So that, that, that just tells you in one, doesn't it? About how important an identity, a project and a plan and a path for players is and not, we're Man United. <laughs> Sadio Mane, the deal was, was almost done. We, we, we knew this at the time. Um, he was Louis van Gaal's number one target. But crucially, he wasn't Manchester United's number one target. And that's, and that's the bottom dollar. This is what it comes down to. 
Klopp rang him and said, this club is for you. We're on the up. And if you come here, we're going to do great things. And Lou Van Gaal was like, I want you. But, you know, I'm only here for a couple of years. <laughs> do you mm. know what I mean? And I'm off. I'm at the end of my career. And Manchester United did not do a very good job of selling their football club to the player. So he's certainly a player you could have got. And you'd have got him for a really good price. Like, now can you imagine the comparison of, of what you'd have played for Mane? That kind of, I think, around 30 million or something around that mark at that time for a player from Southampton. But of course, Man United fans didn't want him either, Scott. So this is the I remember, problem. I didn't as well. I, I wasn't... It wasn't the type of signing at the time that I was like, oh, my, my imagination's going. And they, it, it, they even got me in at that point. I, th- I think when you look at the players that Van Gaal brought in, I, I was a big fan of Man. I really, well, I, I, I again, wrote about him that year about Southampton and his figures and his metrics. And we talked about how he was like ready to explode in terms of his goal numbers because he was always there, had these big opportunities, but Southampton were, weren't fantastic. They were a good team and they didn't really help Mane. And it was like, well, if he has help around him, he could really kick on. I, I really wanted him at Man United. Absolutely was banging on doors saying, let's go and get Sadio Mane. And know that Van Gaal wanted him was a big part of that. But Manchester United did not really want him, Scott. And that was the problem is that the player went, I, you know, as you said, his contract was there. Contract was on his, on his lap. And he still turned down one of the biggest clubs in the world because Liverpool made the correct concerted effort to get a player. So this is where it has to be now, you see, Scott, this, with, with, the, with the new signings. You're talking about Frankie de Jong. Frankie de Jong must be convinced that he's coming to Man United for five years. He can't be convinced that in a year's time, Ten Hag's going to get sacked. You know, he can't look at uh, Donny van der Beek and think, hmm, Donny got told this 12 months ago. Am I going to get hoodwinked here? So all of these things matter, don't they? So I think it's interesting that Mane's spoken about that again and being really honest. It'd be quite interesting to see if Sadio Mane is at Liverpool next season. Yeah, he's uh, out of contract in a year as his most Salah and has spoken a few times this week, actually, ahead of the Champions League final, suggesting, eh, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Bayern Munich are certainly interested yeah. in him. PSG, I think, have been linked with him as well. Uh, maybe and he's done the classic, I will reveal my future after the Champions League final uh, speech. And I thought... Mm-hmm. But the thing, like I was speaking to a Liverpool fan yesterday and yeah. asked him about how he felt about Mane potentially going. And he said, it would be disappointing. But at the same time, I have faith that the club can replace him. You know, and that that's that's how you run a football club. You've got to move players on eventually. And, you know, I, I think, again, a good comparison that is Coutinho at Liverpool. Was that when, when he left, they absolutely mugged Barcelona for that transfer fee. <laughs> Coutinho yeah. mugged Barcelona for his wage packet. You know, he was on an incredible wage going over there to Catalonia. But I think overall, you have to accept that players do leave, but have a recruitment strategy in place to replace them. So I think they're going to lose Salah as well. Salah has said this week, you know, we don't talk about Liverpool too much, but Salah has said, I'm staying at Liverpool next year. Now, that's not to placate Liverpool. That's to tell Liverpool, I'm seeing out my contract. That's that. Yeah. So Mane, I think, might be the guy that jumps ships early. Because if you win the Champions League again, God forbid, you know, that happens against Real Madrid, Hala Madrid, to all our Spanish people, speaking fans here watching the show, um, then... What's the what's the point in staying? Are you gonna stay in the Premier League, sign a big new contract? He's gonna get more money elsewhere, and I think that's what this will come down to. Yeah, uh, I think we're all Team Real Madrid, aren't we? <laughs> but well, we um, are on this show. We definitely <laughs> are on this show. We definitely are on this show. You can't you can't go back in other English clubs in the Champions League anymore. Uh, I'm sure if United, if roles were reversed, I don't think Liverpool fans would be cheering for United. Oh, God. Do, you know, uh, do you know what I mean? It's like, it, 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 I mean, it's, a proper Liverpool fan has never cheered a Man United team. And I don't think that any Man United fan would ever really want Liverpool to have success. Of course not. At least they didn't do the quadruple, Rob. At least they didn't the, yeah, and we shall celebrate that like we won the Champions League ourselves. <laughs> yeah. As sad uh, as that might be, but that's where our football club is. 23 years ago yesterday, as we record this. Oh, uh, I know. That night uh, in Barcelona. (laughs) Yeah. And it seems like an awful long time ago. I remember exactly where I was. Uh, I'm sure you do too. Uh, Yeah. But I was was 10 at the time. Or just two. I I was a bit older than 10. You know, I was was drinking champagne after that game. Uh, But I do think looking back over that, that's like, you know, since a quarter of a century ago. It's a long time. We're in danger of becoming the history boys. We're getting old. Manchester United's success 
feels like it's getting further and further away. But this is why I'm kind of excited about the Ten Hag era because it's something new at least. It's a new yeah. direction because we've been treading water for 10 years. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Rob, before we wrap up today? No, not really. As I said, it's, uh, it's now the summertime and it really is crazy in terms of the news with transfers. And it's just going to be players linked to United every single day. But we will do our best 100% to keep up to date with it all and try and with the show going twice weekly to give you the most up-to-date transfer news. Yes, indeed. Thanks again, Rob, for today's show. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, etc. And watch us twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays on YouTube as well. So head over to the channel, hit the like button, subscribe and join the community. And the link should be in the description of this episode. If you're listening on an audio platform uh, on Twitter, at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B and at Promise and MU for the show. We'll be back early next week to chat more Man United. Maybe we'll have five new players to talk about by then, but I don't think so. Maybe it'll take a little bit longer than that. But thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, if you are watching with us. And we'll see you soon.